It's synonymous with sophisticated elegance, high performance, and secret agents. For over a hundred years, Aston Martin has made distinguished sports cars. But now, this tiny British brand stands alone. We are a David versus a Goliath. Battling multinational conglomerates in an ever-changing world. Aston Martin has no margin for error. To survive, they need a new machine. We are it. There is no helper or big brother. A small but dedicated team looks to the past, only to find salvation in an old American hot rodder's trick. I was absolutely adamant, we're going to make this do 200 miles an hour. A uniquely English machine called the V12 Vantage S. In 2007, Aston Martin stands as one of the top European sports car manufacturers in the world. Winning both on the racetrack and also on the showroom floor. We were really into our stride and producing over 7,000 cars. And we had established a DB9 as the, the new icon, a super cool GT. We got the V8 Vantage in production and we established what we call the new era. Almost without warning, the world economy collapses. Overnight, Aston Martin loses its empire. Some challenges in the market, for sure, from 2008 onwards, a global recession. It's a global recession that sends car makers around the world into a tailspin. For Aston Martin, it's now due or die. Aston Martin is one of the very few independent, really small car makers. Most supercar manufacturers are owned by worldwide conglomerates. But Aston Martin has no corporate safety net. The company's next move could be its last. No matter what's going on in the company, in the economy, and whatever, these guys got to be thinking, I want to build a sports car, I want to build a sports car. And well, they did. Now, for the first time in over 20 years, its success or failure rests solely in British hands. They have to fight for their own little niche. They don't have economies of scale, which other manufacturers have, so they have to pay more for every single part that they develop for their cars. So what Aston has done, sort of repurpose the same architecture and their same engine to make new things. Lead designer Marek Reichman itches to push the brand forward. We've always had a policy of, of thinking about what could we do next with the assets that we have around us. What would be exciting? With limited money to build a new machine from the ground up, Reichman has to do a lot with a little. The idea was, well, what if we put the V12 engine into the Vantage? How could we make that work? Squeezing the brand's biggest engine into one of its smallest and oldest chassis is a daring proposition. Yet the notion ignites a passion for speed. And that genesis absolutely of, of Ian coming along and saying, hey, you know, we have this idea, we, we talked together, said this will be an amazing car to do. The engineering team quickly sets its sights on creating a bold goal. When we're laying down the targets for the V12 Vantage S, I was absolutely adamant to the guys, we're going to make this do 200 miles an hour. An outrageous top speed isn't the only objective. We wanted to get below the magic four seconds of 0 to 60. So it really came out of a small group of guys free thinking but once we got hold of the concept, we thought, yeah, this is a serious project and a serious car. With the performance targets set, the design team faces a unique challenge. How to take an existing and universally applauded supercar and fit a substantially larger engine inside it. We had a VMAX target. All those were defined. We create the sketch, and that sketch has to look like an Aston Martin. Making an Aston Martin look like an Aston Martin 
is no easy task. Your first reaction has to be, it's beautiful. It takes time to find the right balance of beautiful. If I was to describe the thing that we had to win, it was about making sure that proportion was absolutely perfect. So the fight was for perfection. It's a distinctly British form of perfection that starts in a very old world way. All Aston Martin start with a sketch. In my mind, that immediately starts to give you a proportion. Within that proportion, you have to fit the person. So you can then start to realize where the front wheel is, where the rear wheel is, where the occupant will sit, and you can start to sketch. You can start to have an idea of the form, the language of the car. That language is the key to Aston's rebirth. And it's all due to a time-honored process. That sketch then becomes a three-dimensional scale model. Designers design a lot of stuff on computers, but you can't touch what's on the computer screen. But you can touch what's in clay. At first, they create an eight-scale model. It's a fast way to bring the language of the car to life. At that point, we can then start to scan that three-dimensional form. The CAD doesn't understand whether this is a scale model or not because we can convert the scale to full size so we can turn a 10 millimeter square into a 100 millimeter square. So immediately then we have a surface. Once the surface becomes digital, the team can look for the most minute imperfections. Our role is to get the scan data and the nuances that are done physically by the clay modeler. Our job is to refine those. Then we go back to the physical world to make sure what we've done is correct. Modelers work tirelessly to perfect the shape in the real world. Handcrafting each sensuous curve in clay on a life-size model. I'm not a designer, but it's all about their proportions. It's all about the way that car sits with that big long hood and just the elegant, simple lines that go across it. They're just timeless. When you build something in clay, you get this full-size model and you get the whole feeling of how the car looks and what it's going to express that you just don't get if you design the car solely on a computer screen. We're looking for the most beautiful proportion all the time. We use golden section naturally as designers to create form, to create shape. The golden section, or golden ratio, is a mathematical formula used to describe beauty. It was first discovered by the ancient Greeks over 2,500 years ago. It's a theorem that tries to find logic in beauty. Yet even today, it still affects the most exotic and modern supercars in the world. It's a rule and a principle, a mathematical rule. It comes from nature. The Nautilus shell, for instance, everything within the Nautilus shell fits perfectly within that golden section, the golden triangle, as it were. The golden rule might come from the old world, but the design team's use is uniquely contemporary and uniquely British. The Brits are known for understated design. They bring cues from the 60s and 70s, and they brought that all the way into today. It's not an easy thing to define necessarily, but it's an elegant, classy design. It's not vulgar in any way. There's no huge affectations. Aston Martin means these sporty grand touring cars, cars that you want to drive across continental Europe in 10 minutes with your foot on the floor. They're incredibly powerful, but they're also incredibly comfortable and beautiful. It's a car to be seen in. It's the understated gentleman's Ferrari. Marek and his team blend that open appeal with a modern style. That becomes the battle to make sure we get the best looking car that is going to be timeless design, a future classic. So it's really about making sure everyone understands the direction and the goal. That goal is a contemporary reinterpretation of an old American hot rodder's trick. 
take the biggest, heaviest, and most powerful engine and drop it into the lightest chassis. A 565 horsepower engine called the AM28. And that's just the ancient hot rodder's recipe for making an awesome sports car. Everybody loves a good stick, the biggest motor and the smallest car you got. And sometimes it can be fun, sometimes it can be a little bit too much. In the case of the Aston, it's probably both. Engineers predict that the four extra cylinders will propel the machine to a 329 kilometer an hour top speed. There's only one problem. The engine doesn't actually fit. In an ever-changing automotive landscape, Aston Martin looks to turn heads with a new hot rod-inspired supercar. Since Aston Martin doesn't have a big car maker to support them, they have to do everything on their own. It takes so much money to develop a new car. And if you don't sell four trillion of them, you can't recoup that development cost. They can't afford to make any big mistakes because that could cost the company everything. If Aston misses on anything, I think we're going to have to say goodbye to them. So how does an independent car maker expect to compete with some of the largest car companies in the world? The answer lies in the quiet green hills of Warwickshire, England. Welcome to Gaydon, the beating heart of Aston Martin since 2003. It's one of the most technologically advanced automotive factories in the world. It's a facility where people are manufacturing these beautiful sports cars with great passion. 54 acres of space-age technology paired with British refinement. It's quiet, it's clean, it's very, very high-tech. Every phase from design to production takes place on a single campus. It's here that engineers and designers struggle to solve the critical problems facing the project. The front end of the car was designed around a V8 engine, so the first challenge is actually getting the large engine to fit in the space. Engineers digitally comb over every single millimeter of the engine bay to find a solution. The big challenges were the packaging of an engine which had four more cylinders than the previous engine. Just to give you an example of that, that's, that's about that much longer within the same wheelbase. When engineers first digitally drop the V12 engine into the V8 chassis, they immediately have a problem. So you can start to see some of the pinch points here. And just here on the, uh, the front of the engine, as the, the bonnet dives over, uh, we're, we're in a tight pinch point here. A pinch point is where two pieces don't fit correctly. Getting the engine to fit comes down to just 12.5 millimeters, a little less than the height of two iPhones stacked on top of each other. Usually, we'd look for uh, 25 millimeters, but in, in some cases, we've halved that. In the end, 12.5 millimeters are the key to bringing a new machine to life. The pressure on Aston must be enormous because they have such limited resources and they have to keep coming out with different things. Any failure could mean the end of the Mark's illustrious legacy. One of the challenges that we believe we always take on here is doing the impossible. With their reputation hanging in the balance and perhaps their solvency, the Aston Martin design team boldly surges forward. As a small independent car company, they're a lot more agile. They can do fun things, they can do crazy things like that car. Things they wouldn't get through a regular car company's processes. That's something that we would say, well, of course we can do it. We don't have to follow this rule, we don't have to think in this way. We can make it work. It's a unique form of bravado from a company that's no longer willing to keep a stiff upper lip. But if they built like some sort of car that wasn't really an Aston Martin and you know they spent a lot of money on it and it didn't sell, that could kill the company. This small independent is about to go toe to toe with some of the most powerful companies in the world. But only if it can learn to control something that you can't actually see. In the world of extreme supercars, powerful engines always get the glory. 
but it's the air surrounding them that provides the greatness. Literally, as you shoehorn your foot into a very tight shoe, that's what we try to do with the V12 Vantage S engine. Shoehorning the larger V12 into the chassis is just the first step. The real key is to manage the airflow around and inside the machine itself. And we've got a lot to come through the engine bay. What we're going to do with all that air that's going into the front of the car. Controlling the air creates three distinct challenges. First, the machine needs to be tuned so that it's stable at high speed. At 200 miles an hour, an airplane can take off. At 200 miles an hour, a car can take off too. So you want to make sure that the aero package is right so that the car stays on the road. But the car also needs to cut through the air easily. That requires creating the least amount of drag possible. Drag is a type of air resistance. Drag effectively is the force you've got to hammer. How hard you've got to work to push the air out of the way. Tuning the machine to be stable and reducing the drag proved to be easy compared to cooling the machine. We've got a more powerful engine and it fills the engine bay a lot more. As soon as we, we found out we're going to get put a V12 in this car, first thing for me was, you know, what we're going to do with uh, all that heat. A team of aerodynamicists use a sophisticated three-dimensional model made up of over 60 million cells to find the best way to move the air. The first step is to map what you can't see. Red is good, and um, that means there's lots of energy left in the air. So this is us before we get to the car. And as the car passes through the air, that energy is transformed into heat rejection. Air particles pass through the car in just 50 milliseconds. In that 50 milliseconds worth of time, that air has to cool the brakes. It has to travel around the car without causing too much drag. And it also has to make sure that the car is absolutely planted at speed. The air loses half its energy before it even hits the engine. Within the space of about 100 millimetres, or the, the length of, of your forearm, um, there is slowed down from 200 miles an hour down to 100 miles per hour. When the machine is moving, the air slows down quickly. But when the machine is stopped, getting the hot air out is even trickier. To do that, they tune the louvres on the hood. Aerodynamics is, is kind of seen as being high speed, but actually delivers more at low speed. What we've got here is, this is a prototype bonnet. We've got this bonnet here, which has all got these extra louvers in, which we derive from, from motorsports experience. These, these parts actually in here, they can be changed. If I flip it over, you can see each one of them is tunable. So we tuned these to get the maximum airflow through them. Whilst it's running at high speed, so it draws more air out, that gives you kind of a better head start. If you keep the engine cool in the first place, you haven't got such a mountain to climb when you actually stop. But also, when the car stops, it allows all that heat that was built up inside the engine bay to come out. At speed, managing the airflow is critical and complicated. Because air travels through components at pressures a thousand times greater than the capacity of the human lung, how the team channels it throughout the vehicle makes all the difference. We've got to kind of separate that out between how much goes into the engine to give us the extra power to reach the, the top speed, how much we need to obviously cool the engine. You're going to heat the brakes up to 700 degrees. We've got to have airflow pumping into those wheel arches to, to cool those that down. So it's a it's finite balance of we're trying to achieve all those things with all the air around the car. From an engineering standpoint, the V12 Vantage S is an engine-heavy dragster, just like the 1950s American hot rods that inspired it. V12 Vantage is a real engineer's car. There's a bit of hot rod in there because it's the big engine in the smaller car. One of the keys to a great hot rod is how it sounds. Inside a hidden garage, off limits to the public, engineers use a high-tech camera system with 32 microphones 
to visually chart the engine's audio signals. This lets the team precisely tune which sounds occupants hear and which they don't. The camera records data at 96,000 times per second. They then use a color map to identify the noise characteristics, with purple being the loudest sound. Finally, they combine the camera imagery with the audio data to pinpoint exactly where the sounds originate, sounds which help intensify Aston's unique exhaust note. Absolutely beautiful noise that you only get from a 12-cylinder engine. I mean, they don't sound like anything else. The problem is, Aston Martin doesn't make hot rods. They make exquisite supercars laced with sophistication. Today's global buyers expect more than just a big engine. Anybody can make a fast car these days. What Aston really needs to do is appeal to the emotional side. There's a, an understated elegance about an Aston Martin. It's maybe more about wearing the label on the inside than the label on the outside. It is the gentleman supercar. First of all, they look the part, they sound the part. They're a little bit more restrained, but they are no less serious when it comes to performance. So how do you transform a hot rod into an Aston Martin? And there were some really long nights on that, of saying, how do we make this work? How do we get that mix of refinement, but with a little bit of rawness into there? A fateful discussion over a cup of coffee has led Aston Martin to put their largest engine into their smallest chassis. The question now is how do they transform this modern hot rod into a refined luxury vehicle? It's always about pushing the technology, pushing the innovation of the material. High-tech and handmade are two staples at the Gaydon factory, where over 200 man-hours go into the assembly of just one Vantage. The process begins in the trim department. This is Gaydon trim shop. This is where all the leather panels are all stitched together. Each Vantage interior utilizes six full hides of leather. These are Alcantara panels. These have just come from the sewing area. The parts are now being laid out into the spray booths, and the adhesive is now being applied. Once the glue is sprayed, the leather workers have just four minutes to apply it to the plastic. Now the adhesive is no longer wet, it's just tacky. Once you put the two parts together, it forms a permanent bond. There are 50 trimmers, and they'll make over 300 parts a day. It takes roughly 50 hours to make all the interior trim pieces for just one Vantage. And the most important tool has a name that harkens back to Stonehenge. There is one major tool, that tool is called a bone, and that is the one that pretty much does it all. The leather parts might be made very traditionally, but if you order a bespoke Vantage, the stitching is absolutely high-tech. This is the quilting operations area. This is where our bespoke quilting is produced. The quilting machine looks fast. It had better be. There's more than one million stitches in a Vantage. While old-world artisans spend two days crafting the interior, it takes just half as long to build the space frame. Each panel or casting arrives at the factory having already been superformed, a process where metal is heated to extreme temperatures before being stamped into a final shape. Robots supply oxy adhesive. The adhesive is both more accurate and stronger than a traditional weld. The entire space frame is cured in an oven at 185 degrees centigrade for over 30 minutes. A slow burn for a fast machine. Now the chassis is ready to receive its bodywork. Then they fit the doors. 
front quarter panels and bonnet. Each body is inspected by hand. Then it's time for a splash of English colour. We're now at the start of the Aston Martin paint process. As you can see, we've got the, the car delivered into paint. Quite a different car as to what you're going to see at the end of the process. Only at Aston Martin, that colourful demeanour is just as special as the machine itself. The full paint process takes on average 50 hours per car. Unlike high volume factories where cars are painted in batches of the same colours, at Gaydon, each vehicle is painted individually. It's not efficient, but it is effective, even though they actually use very little paint. 120 microns of paint will be added to the car, of which we will remove 30 microns in our polish process to make it a mirror glass finish. So in theory, you have got something the thickness of that on the car finished gloss level. That shine starts with a single coat of primer. Now it's ready for the prep line. The idea of the prep line is we look for any imperfection before base coat is applied. We have a very big ethos with prep work. Once the car is primed and prepped, it's ready for paint. This car will have base coat applied in the booth there. It will then be dried for 20 minutes, moved into a flash off oven, and then we apply the clear coat by hand. Each Vantage then receives two layers of paint and two layers of clear coat. Some done by robots, some done by hand. The paint shop has a degree of automation. We've got some robots in there for spraying, and lots of hand finishing to get the depth of paint finish onto the car. The machine is ready to be polished. Very different to high volume, run of the mill factories. You will not get this process. Once painted, it's time to put the machine together. In the final assembly hall, where it takes 42 stations to build a Vantage. We're currently on the first part of the assembly line, trim one. Throughout the rest of this line, we're fitting some of the key parts that your average driver doesn't really think about on a day-to-day -day basis. It's a very classic way to build a supercar. And the only way to build an Aston Martin. Superficially, it can look very similar to a conventional car production process. It's still very much a craft-based production system. Rear deck lids are pre-assembled and then installed. Finally, the car is ready for its massive handcrafted instrument panel. The technicians will use this big device here, this assister, because it's a very heavy part of the IP, then pick it up and mount it to the vehicle. While the majority of the work on the line is done by hand, the newest addition to Gaydon is completely automated. The robot places adhesive on the edge of the windscreen and is far more precise than a human. Well, it's the first part of automated equipment that we have on this line, and we've done it solely to help us improve quality. Quality that meets performance on an adjoining sub-assembly line, where the powertrain begins to come to life with the naturally aspirated V12 engine. We're now in the powertrain sub-assembly area. Here you can see one of the V12 engines. And what we do is we take the engine in a pallet. We load it up like this, and then we carry it over to the first part of the assembly process.
where we assemble the engine to the torque tube, and we then have the gearbox at the back of the vehicle. They continue to build up the drivetrain by bolting on the transmission, followed by the catalytic converters, then the heat shield, rear disc brakes and suspension. So we fix what we call the front corner units. So that's the assembly of the brake disc, the brake parts and the suspension parts before we then marry it up to the car. The front suspension is built as a separate sub-assembly where they bolt on the 398 mm carbon ceramic disc brakes. Once it's completed, it's joined to the rest of the drivetrain. We need to fit the radiator on the front of the engine unit. By having the engine, torque tube, and gearbox arrangement, we can get the optimum weight distribution in the car, which is so important for the handling of the vehicle. 85% of the weight distribution sits between the wheels, helping agility on a track. The seven-speed transmission launches the machine from zero to 100 kilometers an hour in under four seconds. Now it will take the team at Gaiden 40 minutes to install the single most important piece of the Vantage. It's taken over 100 man hours for the fastest, production-based Aston Martin ever to get to the single most important station on the line. The bit that I like the best is what we call the marriage station, where we take the whole of the driveline of the car, and we marry that up into the body structure of the car. Even though the machine is now married, it's not quite ready for a honeymoon. The Vantage still needs some key bits of kit. Like exhaust pipes. The front bumper. There is no line that intersects between the lamp and the fender. It's, it's embedded like a, a jewel set in a ring. Jewelry that takes a surprisingly long time to install. It takes 15 minutes to set just one headlight. Then they place the tail lights. Clearly these cars are gonna need some wheels. And after that, we build up the interior trim of the vehicle. The Vantage is ready to move to the very last line. And trim 3 is around fitting all the parts of the car that you touch and you feel when you're inside the car.
front seats come to the line fully assembled from the trim shop. Then the hand-sewn steering wheel. Doors are brought to the line and carefully installed. Once we fitted the doors, the car will complete the last couple of stations on the assembly process. As the car nears the end of the line, there's one more key step. The famed Aston Martin wing so precious that they keep it locked up until it's ready to be installed. This is the only badge or wing left in the automotive industry made by a jeweler. So we know this is very special. Before a completed Aston Martin can leave the factory, it must first take a few laps around the test track. This is part of the off-tracks facility. This is our new rolling road. It's going to get up to about 70 or 80 miles an hour. Off tracks is where each vehicle is tested to meet quality control standards like wind noise and waterproofing. By doing these test processes in a controlled environment, we can make sure we do it the same every time. Then building a vantage literally hits a bump in the road. In the hydropulse area, they simulate road inputs using hydraulic actuators to find squeaks and rattles. The very last test is a final inspection. Well, we spend about 20 hours uh, specifically checking over the car as it's produced and at the very end of line to make sure it's absolutely perfect before we ship it on to a customer. It's taken almost 10 days of assembly to complete the V12 Vantage S. The fastest production-based Aston Martin ever built and a bold gambit by one of the only remaining independent car makers in the world. In a hyper-competitive automotive world, Aston Martin must do a lot with a little in order to stay relevant. Building a car on your own is expensive. If they build the wrong car that doesn't sell, they're a company that's going to be in a lot of trouble. Now, after months of sketches, sculpting, and intricate assembly, the risky idea is finally ready to enter the real world. The first thing you do when you get into any Aston Martin is go, how do I start it? You have this, this key that is made out of crystal. And you put it in a slot in the dash, and you press it in, hold it, and then the engine starts. Aston calls it the emotional control unit. You could look at it as gimmicky, but when it's that beautiful, it doesn't matter. It's a little bit of theater, but my god. If you're going to do theater, you might as well do it on a car that looks like that. You fire the car up and it just goes Burr. And it just wakes up like it's been in some deep slumber and it's really pissed off that you just woke it up. And then you go out driving it and more of that happens. It 
represents a decidedly angry form of British sophistication. And Athens are British Camaros. They're loud, they're brash, they're rough. What Aston's done brilliantly over the years is taking a small number of ingredients and making a lot of different dishes with them. This V12, for example, dates back to the year of the flood. It's really old. What makes the AM28 so unique isn't new technology, but rather old technology at its best. Thank God it's not a turbo. Downsizing an engine and putting turbos on it makes easy power, but I call it cheating. It's just too easy. There is a charm and a personality that normally aspirated engines have. And that's something we're missing out on. To have a naturally aspirated engine these days is actually becoming kind of rare. It's old technology, but there's something kind of special about it. It's an angry, angry car, and it's really visceral and really powerful. It really speaks to you in that way. And every time Aston comes out with a new version of this engine, you think, oh, they're beating this dead horse. Except the horse ain't dead. This, this horse is faster than the previous one. It sounds better. It's more powerful. It responds better. The V12 Vantage S is the most mainstream Aston to ever crack the 330 kilometer an hour barrier. We sort of dialed a few things up, maybe from 10 to 11 in, in some cases, and we put more power and performance into the car. 205 miles an hour is incredible. It's a completely different world. This is the highest performance version of a high performance version of a high performance version of the Vantage. Every time you step up the ladder, you get a little bit more jewelry and spoilers and stuff like that. It's an extreme way of building a car, and that's not for everybody. You throw fuel economy out the window, you throw everything that most people really care about on a daily basis, you throw that out the window and you build an extreme car that's loud and powerful and raucous and fast. An extreme car with extreme performance. If you take one drive in one of these cars, you realize that the people who are working behind the scenes at Aston are clearly sports car guys. Sports car guys who continue to battle for their very survival by doing the only thing they know how to do, build beautifully exotic supercars. At the end of the day, no matter what I drive, at whatever speed and whatever track, I always come away from the Aston thinking, God, that's more fun than anything else. I, I pinch myself every single day still after almost nine years that this is not a job, it's a, it's a vocation, it's something which is very hard to describe the feeling. Just the sensation of what you're actually achieving in terms of the heritage, the future of the brand of Aston Martin. They are the most communicative sports cars on the market now, and they show no signs of moving anywhere away from that. If that means there's no Aston in 20 years, hey, at least we had some of the best cars now.